So I'm sorry if I ramble. I'm awake now, semi-sober, and ready to finish this for you guys, the internet, and whoever cares to hear it. I didn't find out that Mr. Mays had passed away until a couple of months after the funeral service. Initially, I was going to seek out his family in order to send my condolences, but it wasn't as if Mr. Mays and I were best friends or anything like that, so I refrained. I continued through my college career and graduated a year or so after our bar meeting. Graduating with English as my major wasn't a mistake, but it, uh, well, it wasn't exactly something that landed me any sort of immediate job after college. No, I've saved a pretty solid amount of money while I was in school and decided that I deserved a little bit of a vacation, if you will. I took my spare cash, got together with my college buddy Steve, packed up and hit the road, aiming for somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. Now, I had lived in Littleton, Colorado when I was younger, and I remember loving the area, so this destination was as good as any. The trip was a success. We had made it somewhere around Estes Park, Colorado, and I found a cheap cabin that we could rent for about a month. In the days that we filled with lounging, hiking, and generally things that involved little to no work on our parts, after our rental was through, we packed up again and headed on our way back east. Sometime during this trip, we had met up with a couple of Estes Park's natives in one of the local bars. And we never typically hung out with any of them or anything like that. We just had conversations now and then over drinks and food. And well, one night, these guys were paying their tab and packing up to leave awfully early. And they were usually there until the wee hours of the morning. When we questioned them about it, they told us that they were headed to a little get-together with some friends of theirs. And they invited us, having nothing else to do. We hopped in the car and followed them to the party. The party itself was very low-key and ultimately inconsequential to the story. However, the important thing about it was that at some point in the night, we were all sitting around the fire and swapping ghost stories. And At this point in my life, I wasn't as much of a ham as I was in my younger years, but with a little bit of encouragement, I started on a couple of these stories that I remembered telling in my youth. And eventually, I made it to Mr. Mays' story about the showers. Every time that I had told it after hearing it from Mr. Mays, I had spiced it up a little bit, but out of some sort of subconscious respect for my former teacher, I went straight into the version that he told uh, my class in my sophomore year of high school. The group enjoyed my story for the most part, the showers being the mutual favorite among the partygoers, and uh, Steve and I left for the cabin at about five in the morning. He asked me about the story on the drive home. I told him about Mr. Mays, uh, that class, my love for everything horror-related and whatnot, and he suggested that we try to find the place on our trip back to New York. Initially, I was reluctant, simply because I didn't feel like aimlessly wandering through Nebraska for days looking for some old farm building that was probably demolished at this point, but a couple of days before we left Colorado, I told Steve that it sounded like fun, and we weren't going to do anything else on the trip, so I figured that we might as well make the best of it. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought of it as a little tribute to Mr. Mays, a guy that, in retrospect, helped me realize that I wanted to be a writer. Anyway, we left Colorado and made the long, boring, and barren drive to Broken Bow, Nebraska, or hell on earth, as Mr. Mays had put it. We found a motel in town and hung around a couple of days, venturing out a hundred miles or so in any given direction each day after that. I remember Mr. Mays telling us that it was somewhere outside of Broken Bow, but I don't think he got any more specific than that. We tried asking the townsfolk if they had any information about the showers, but we were usually met with blank stares or eye rolling when we told them what exactly this place was. Uh, the only person who seemed to know anything about it was an older lady that worked at a gas station on the outskirts of town. I don't recall her name, but this woman was just one of those cheerful old people, very helpful and generally interested in what anyone had to say to her. And Steve had... Steve had started talking to her at checkout, and she asked about our license plate, commenting about the fact that we were very far from home. And, uh... 
we had nowhere in particular to be, so Steve and I ended up talking to this woman for about 15 minutes, at which point we brought up our hunt for the place known as the Showers. Initially, the name didn't ring any bells for the woman, which made sense seeing as Mr. Mays had just given the name after his experience there, but when I began to describe the details uh, that I remembered from his story at least, the friendly old woman interrupted me. Her tone wasn't scornful or mean in any way, but she became very tense and deliberate with her words from that part on. People don't deal with anything relating to that sort of business around here anymore, she told us. That was all a long time ago. Following her statements, she attempted to be cheerful again, excusing herself to the restroom and wishing us the best on our return trip to New York. Steve and I returned to the car without a word, but both of us were thinking about what that lady had said. Again, she didn't seem very angry at all. She just didn't want to hear another word about it. We were driving back to the hotel before Steve said something. I mean, if I had to live in a place associated with an urban legend or something like that, I would totally mess with anyone who asked about it, he said. I mean, ev eventually, you just get tired of people asking about it, so you just try to scare them to get them to shut up, wouldn't you? Well, I agreed with Steve and kept driving, but the whole experience wasn't sitting right with me. If this was some sort of well-known legend in the area, why did no one else in town seem to know anything about it? But I managed to shrug it off. Mind you, neither of us were scared of finding the showers. This little excursion on our road trip was more like a scavenger hunt, a cap-off to an overall relaxing vacation. Steve and I were basically like tourists hunting for the site at which a famous movie was filmed or something like that. We went into the whole situation with little to no expectations, and a fleeting hope that we would be able to find this place. We spent another day in Broken Bow before we took our next trip out to find uh, the showers. Nebraska isn't as terrible of a place as people make it out to be, but it really isn't all that exciting. We found a bar and spent some time there, and that was just about the extent of our activity on our day off. When we did get back to the road, we decided that we would attempt to stay off of the main road for as much of the day as we could. Well, I knew that there was no way that this place was going to be off the highway, and I remembered some details about a dirt road in Mr. Mays' story, so we went looking for those. This was a fairly futile effort. I mean, most of Nebraska is dirt roads. It was seven in the evening when we came upon a small but thick forest. I use the term lightly, but for Nebraska, this place was like an oasis. The trees were full and thick, shrouding most of the insides in darkness, and the sun was setting, and even though we had run into a few of those random crops of trees, that we agreed that this one showed more promise than any of the others. There wasn't really a road, but there looked to be a path where a dirt road might have been at some point. So we drove along it, and if the car was able to handle the Rocky Mountains, a dirt path in Nebraska would give us no trouble. So we moved slowly and carefully along the trail, making sure to clear any fallen trees in the road or rocks that would render the car useless when the sun finished setting. It was pretty dark in the place during the day, but when night came, it was something else entirely. I had an inkling at this point that we might have found the right place, but I didn't want to jinx it, so we continued onward. I didn't realize it at the time, but the little bits of light that managed to penetrate the canopy in this miniature forest actually did make it look like a lot of the tree branches were trying to grab the car, just like Mr. Mays had mentioned in the story. I'm still convinced that he made up the part about the animal eyes, though. The more aggressive creatures we saw in the woods were a dead rabbit on the side of the trail. It didn't have any obvious signs of death, it just looked like it had simply laid down and never bothered to get up. We drove around in the darkness for quite a while before we found a clearing. We had to move several smaller clusters of branches out of the way before, but right in front of our exit was a giant, dead monster of a tree. There was no way that we were moving this one, so... 
We got out, turned on the bright headlights in the hopes that it would illuminate the area in front of us. Now, there was a feeling of excitement mixed strangely with fear when I saw what lay fifty feet beyond the clearing. There, lit partially by the headlights from the car and little bits of light from the crescent moon, was what appeared to be an old barn house. Now, this wasn't a typical farmhouse. It was larger than the barns that I had seen in films and didn't have any sort of crest. It basically looked like a small warehouse. I wasn't entirely sure at this point if this was the place that we were looking for, but this was definitely the closest that we had come. I moved through the brush until I was roughly 20 feet from the entrance, at which point all the growth seemed to stop. I don't know if the owner had done something to the soil or the whole structure had a border around it that was clear of any sort of plant life. I approached the entrance of the building, a large, solid door, as Steve came up behind me with two flashlights in hand. So you were just going to run off into the place in the dark? He laughed. I gave a half-hearted chuckle and grabbed one of the lights from his hand. Mine was a little, but pretty bright flashlight. It was the kind that hikers would most likely fasten to their backpacks just in case they were stranded at night. And it worked well enough. I grabbed the metal door with both hands holding the flashlight with my mouth and gave it a tug. It moved slightly, creaked a little bit, but there was no way I was doing this by myself. Steve came up from behind me, set his flashlight on the ground, grabbed the door, and said, One. Two. Three. And we pulled to the door with all that we could muster. Once we had managed to move it a couple of inches, it must have latched back into the track because it slid very easily, stopping hard with a loud and echoing thud. When it was completely open, Steve picked up his flashlight and walked behind me. I had already moved inside. The inside of the structure was exceptionally bare, almost troublingly so. I wasn't entirely sure how far we were from the nearest home or small town, but there wasn't even the slightest bit of evidence that anyone had been in this building for years. There were no broken beer bottles or empty bags of chips. There weren't even any animal droppings or eager plants that managed to grow here. And the room was expansive, large, larger than any average farm. But not the warehouse sized monstrosity that I believe Mr. Mays had described in the story. I was sure that it was simply a holding area for farm equipment or, or something similar at that point. Disappointed. I wandered near the entrance while Steve ventured into the expanse of darkness. As I was running over the details of the story in my mind, something struck me like a sack of bricks. In Mr. Mays' story, there was a silo near the barn. I ran outside, my eyes adjusted easily because at the very least, it was brighter outside. And I looked in all directions, running around the perimeter of the building. Surely, if there was ever a silo near this place, there would be some evidence of it somewhere. But despite my hopes, there was nothing but a cluster of thick bushes on one side, brush and dirt everywhere, and the forest that we had come from. I walked back into the building, frustrated and tired, and Steve was still excited, eagerly running around the inside of the building. Even if I could just find a shower head or a pipe, he said, then we'd know that it was true. I mean, just keep looking with me. I didn't want to ruin his excitement. I had told Steve the story several times, but obviously he didn't realize that this was just not the place. The building was weird, yes. It was out of place and oddly pristine, but it, it wasn't the location of the showers. I let him explore a little bit before I called him over. This is probably as close as we're going to get, man, I said. But this isn't it. I remember the silo? His face went from excitement to disappointment in an instant, much like a young child who didn't get the presents that he wanted for his birthday. I patted him on the shoulders. 
This is still pretty cool, though. I mean, we could still tell people that we found it. I was reverting back to my old habits quickly. Steve laughed. Yeah, man, I guess we could. And it was definitely creepy enough. We should get some pictures as proof, you know? I agreed with him. I'm gonna go grab the camera real quick, he said, as he bolted out of the entrance of the building. I was left alone in the building. It was very quiet when I was alone in there. It was very quiet when I was alone in there. I could hear the faint sound of Steve running through the brush and to the car, but once he was far enough away, everything was just quiet. I remember not even hearing wind or the chirping of crickets as I walked deeper into the dark, flashlight in hand. I was convinced that there had to be something. As I approached the far corner of the room, the sound of my feet scratching against the dirt was interrupted by a soft, hollow thud. I stopped trying to figure out what it was. I put my foot down hard against the ground and I heard it again. I stomped one more time, realizing that the floor that I was standing on was covering something hollow. I walked to the wall of the building, looking carefully at the floor to try to spot any holes or gaps. As far as I had known, it was solid ground this thing sat atop, so I was convinced that I had found a hatch or a basement or something, and I heard Steve coming back through the brush as I shouted, Steve, come over here, it's hollow. As I went to say the word hollow, I hopped a little bit, hoping to recreate the sound so that it would be able to be heard upon the entering the door, and the second that my feet made contact with the floor, I felt it give out beneath me. The memory of the fall is fuzzy, but I do recall hearing wood splinter. I remember seeing the light from Steve's flashlight falling away into the complete darkness. It wasn't a long fall, but I must have been in a terrible position because I know that I lost consciousness for several seconds at least. When I woke up, I was staring at a bright light. For an instant, I had thoughts about approaching the fabled light at the end of the tunnel, and I was angry at myself. You died in Nebraska, Jack? Wow. You know how to fuck up. My self-depreciation in the afterlife was interrupted by the sound of Steve's voice. Jesus, Jack! Jack, can you hear me? Dude, wake up! Please, wake up! I managed to lift my head up off the floor just enough for him to celebrate. The pain in my head was immense, but it was outweighed by the pain shooting through my knee I knew I had a concussion, but the pain in my knee was just so much more pressing. I looked around until I found my tiny flashlight, then sat up, reassured Steve, I'm okay, just... I just hurt my knee. I bumped my head too, really, really hard. Thanks, thank fuck, man. I thought you were dead. I mean, imagine that though, dying in fucking Nebraska, that'd be awful. His words made me laugh a little bit, but I, I stopped myself. And the slightest shaking hurt my head. It made me incredibly dizzy. I guess, uh... A rope? Said Steve. What? Asked quietly. Should I get a rope to get you out of there? Or, I mean, do you see a ladder? I looked around. The walls that sat in front of me, they were smooth cement. There was no way that I was climbing out of here. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, get, get the rope, I told him. It's buried under all of our stuff. I think it might be my red climbing bag. I'm, I'm not sure. Steve nodded, telling me to hang in there, that he would be back in a little bit, and then he ran off. The silence that followed was uncomfortable. After the sound of Steve's feet scraping the floor above me faded away, I was only able to hear that buzzing that occurs in total silence, intertwined with the pulsing in my head. I pushed myself over the nearest cement wall and braced myself against it, resting and breathing deep in an attempt to calm myself. The cement was unnaturally cold against my back. It was summer, so I only had a t-shirt on, but 
It felt like ice, even through that. Again, this observation was primarily made after the fact. In the moment, it just felt good to lean against something. I sat there, waiting for Steve in the underground basement, and I began to feel uneasy. I felt like an idiot for falling down here. I felt pain from my injuries as well. And that all seemed to fade into one emotion in an instant when I heard what I could only identify as breathing. Somewhere to my left, and I convinced myself that it was my injured mind playing tricks on me for a few moments until my mind decided to rapidly replay Mr. Maze's story. When I had first heard it in that classroom years ago, I was more impressed than I was scared, but now, sitting in a dark basement in the middle of Nebraska, I felt something that I hadn't felt in a long time. It couldn't even be summed up in, a wor in the word fear. As I sat there, I felt all-encompassing. I felt all-encompassing dread. <laughs> 